April is over, which means we need to talk about all of the books that I read last month. My name is Sarah. If you are new here, let's just jump right in. I bit off more than I could chew in the month of April, mainly because my personal life became a bit hectic unexpectedly. Um, I did, however, end up reading 10 things, um, which was probably because I was participating in a couple of different readathons. And whenever I join a readathon, I think I read more because I'm kind of, you know, just getting into the prompts and stuff and it really helps direct my reading. So that was great. Uh, I was supposed to participate in Realmathon, didn't do that. Uh, I'm not even really that sorry about it, honestly, because I was just overwhelmed with other stuff going on in my life during the month last month. I did, however, participate in Tor.comathon and Assassins in April. So that was really fun. It was, they were both the same week. I kind of wish they had been on different weeks, but it was great. I really enjoyed my reading in April. So let's recap. The first book that I read in April, um, that I finished in April, because I actually started it in March, was A Far Wilder Magic by Alison Saft. This was an e-arc that I had, and um, honestly, it was not my favorite book. It was really slow, very character focused. We spent a lot of time in the characters' heads. They were teenagers, a lot of angst. I just don't think that this book was the kind of book that's for me, honestly. So basically the premise is that we have these two teenagers, Margaret and Wes, and Margaret's mom has left and she's all alone and she really wants her mom to come home. Wes uh, really wants to be an alchemist, but he has flunked out everywhere that he's been apprenticed because he's dyslexic and the world that he's living in, like dyslexia isn't really a thing. They don't understand what it is. And so he's just seen as being kind of lazy um, or like a screw up. And so Wes shows up at Margaret's house because Margaret's mom is actually a famous alchemist. Of course, she is not there. So when Wes is like, please, please let me stay until your mom gets back, Margaret is like, sure, I guess. And then this supernatural creature called the Hala, which is like a fox, shows up and this big hunt is gonna happen and Margaret and Wes team up to kill the fox, Margaret to try and get her mother to come home because as an alchemist, the Hala's body would be really highly prized as an, like an ingredient in the magic and Wes, because if he uh, wins the prize money, it will really help his family because they're really struggling since his father has died and his mother has been injured and can't work anymore. Like all of that sounds great. I think for me, the reason this book just really didn't work in addition to the fact that it's a character focused book and I just need more plot was that the world building was not to my taste. It was really just our world with like different names for things, which I didn't like. And then it also was kind of ambiguous of like the time period, like there were cars and phones and stuff. So I kind of thought it was about the 1930s, but it just didn't really feel specific enough, I guess. Um, and I just felt like the magic wasn't really in this book, like the alchemy that there was wasn't very well explained and it didn't really work for me, I guess. Um, I think this book will probably work better for people who like reading YA more than I do and don't mind all the angst between the two characters. And I think definitely if you're a character reader who loves to like be in the head of a character and know all of their innermost thoughts, that's definitely what this book is. I just really didn't need to spend 400 pages in the mind of two horny teenagers. <laughs> we'll just put it that way. So I gave that three stars. I can't remember if I said that already. Next, I read St. Death's Daughter by C.S.E. Cooney. I have a full review on my channel for this one, so I won't talk too much about it. I will say I ultimately gave it four stars, even though I think there were some serious problems with this book. I really thought the first like 20% was really terrible, but the book saved itself by the end. Um, I don't know if this is C.S.E. Cooney's first book, but there felt like there were some things that were kind of like first book syndrome where it's just, you know, the author is new and so there were some issues that over time I think will improve with more writing. Uh, this one we're following Miscellaneous Stones. She is the daughter of an assassin and an executioner and she is a necromancer and she is allergic to magic. Um, her parents both die under mysterious circumstances and her sister, who is basically a psychopath who like loves being an assassin, comes home and they have to kind of deal with the fallout of their parents' death because their parents were in a lot of debt and they're gonna lose their home. That's the setup. That's not really where the story goes. <laughs> I think that was part of why like, I didn't really like the first 20% of this book. Once the story gets going, it gets much better. The world building in this is really cool. I really enjoyed spending time in this world. It was a bit absurd. And I think that the 
amount of world building and the way the world building done wasn't necessarily the best, but the world itself, because it was so cool, it kind of made me enjoy it more than if it hadn't been cool. Um, we'll put it that way. Also, the battle scene in this is like the best battle scene <laughs> that I have ever read. I enjoyed it so much. Um, and if you can imagine, like, an, with a necromancer, you've got, like, undead battling. So good. That was the second book that I finished, and then I finished reading Sanctuary. Actually, I'm saying these like they're in order. I don't remember what order I read these things in, but Sanctuary by Andy C. Buchanan. This was another e-arc. Unfortunately, another one that just didn't work for me. This was a haunted house story about this found family group of sort of, like, misfit people, all of whom were either neurodivergent or had some kind of representation for some kind of marginalized group. So there was a ton of representation in this book. Uh, we had characters with disabilities, we had characters of diverse backgrounds, diverse cultures, diverse religions, um, diverse sexual orientations and gender expressions. Like we had everything in terms of like representation in this book, but unfortunately that's kind of where the good things about this book stopped. The plot itself just didn't really work for me. Um, the ghosts that were in this is supposed to be like a haunted house story almost, and the ghosts just didn't feel very spooky, and I need ghosts to be at least, like not scary necessarily, but these ghosts were just really bland and boring. We spent way too much time with the character development and the plot was just really underdeveloped. There were some glaring errors, which I'm hoping will be corrected in the final published ver version of this book, but there were some issues with continuity and like a scene at the end that was very, very confusing that went on for a really long time that just I could not understand what the author was trying to get at. So ultimately, three stars for Sanctuary. I'm not really sure who the audience for this book would be. Maybe if you are really desperate to read something that has really good representation, uh, particularly uh, I think neurodivergent characters were sort of the most fulsome representation in this book, you can go check it out, read the description for yourself, see if it sounds interesting. Always make your own decisions, don't depend on me to make decisions for you, that's a recipe for disaster. Now, for Assassins in April, I read Clockwork Boys by T. Kingfisher. I continue to read T. Kingfisher, I really enjoy her stuff. Um, this one I gave four and a half stars, it was very close to a five. Uh, I just really love the way that T. Kingfisher writes, and I love her characters. They are so quirky, so unusual, so unique. In this, we are following a thief, a disgraced paladin, an assassin, and a scholar as they set out on this mission uh, to try and get information about these clockwork automaton soldier things that are attacking their kingdom. Um, and the kind of, the interesting thing is that all of them, except for the scholar, um, are basically, if they, if they do this, they'll be pardoned for crimes, but otherwise they were all going to be executed. I just, this is such a charming group of characters. This is a quest book. They're setting out to go find out information about these automaton things. And there's just so many little details. Like, one little thing that I just love, uh, the the sort of main character in this is the thief, um, and she is just, she's just so lovable in her own way. Her, like, main thing is that she's actually a forger, and she has this allergy to magic, but it's, it's like, different. Like, I just talked about St. Death's Daughter, where, like, the necromancer is allergic to violence, um, but in this, it's funny because the main character, when there's magic around, where when there's something that, like, she's supposed to notice, she smells, um, I think it's marjorie? Yeah, like, the, the herb, um, and she starts sneezing uncontrollably, and so, like, there's this ongoing gag throughout the whole book where the paladin keeps giving her handkerchiefs to, like, wipe her nose <laughs> when she's sneezing, and I just think it's so funny and witty, and, like, it can get dark at times, but at the same time, like, just so down-to-earth and heartfelt, and I just really love T. Kingfisher. The only negative I have to say about Clockwork Boys is that it is really half of a book. So it is a duology. There is a second book um, called... I can't remember what it's called. I'll put the picture up on the screen. Um, but these two books should have just been combined in one volume because the end is very abrupt. It's just like, oh, now's the end. And so I really need to read the second volume or the second book in the duology, um, but I haven't done that yet. So really excited about getting the chance to read that one. And like, if you haven't read 
T. Kingfisher yet. What are you doing? Go pick up one of her books. She has so many different things to offer. Love, love, love. Now, the same week that I was doing Assassins in April, uh, I also was participating in the Tor.com-a-thon, readathon. And so for that, I ended up reading a few things. Um, I read A Spindle Splintered by Alex E. Harrow. I actually listened to this one on audio, which I think was a good choice. It was a novella. Um, this is a sort of retelling modern version of um, Sleeping Beauty. And I didn't love this. I gave it three stars. It, the, the characters were kind of annoying. <laughs> and, and I think like they're teenagers and the voice is very specific for the main character. And like we're in her head, like first person narration, if I'm remembering correctly. And I didn't really enjoy the voice. I think the other thing that I really hated about this is that our main character has an incurable disease and is dying. And I just, I, I don't know how I felt about the way that that was handled in the story. Um, it just, it felt a little bit gratuitous or a little bit exploitative um, in a way that made me a little bit uncomfortable. I am gonna read the sequel, A Mirror Mended. I think is what it's called um because i have an e-arc of that but yeah a spindle splintered it was just fine like i've read a lot of fairy tale retellings there was nothing about this one that really stuck out to me um, obviously it's like more of a feminist take the princesses saving themselves um that kind of thing now i also read siren queen by nevo which is another novella um during tour.com-a-thon and actually it's not a novella. I, I don't know why I said it was a novella. It is short. It's like between 200 and 300 pages, but closer to 300 pages, um, if I'm remembering correctly. And Siren Queen, we are following this Chinese American girl as she grows up in LA, seeing all of the movie stars and she really wants to become one. And she will like literally sell her soul just about to become one. And the thing that's really cool about this book is that the world is filled with magic. I think this is probably like the definition of magical realism where like the magic is just real. It's just part of the world. It's part of the fabric of the world that she lives in. It's the 1920s. I should have mentioned that. I always forget to mention that. Um, and this book just really examines those themes of otherness. So the main character being Chinese American, even though like her mother was born in the US and she was born in the US, but she's seen as other, right? Because she looks different and her heritage is different. Um, like, but she doesn't even speak her like native language or her parents' native language. Like she only speaks English um, and stuff like that. And so that's one type of othering that she has to go through. She also um, has to deal with the way that Hollywood approaches like foreigners, right? Because they see her as foreign, even though she's not, right? She's an American. She's like a second generation American. Um, but Hollywood doesn't see her that way. They see her as the exotic and she really has to fight to get the roles that she wants. And then on top of that, she's also a lesbian. And so that's something that um, obviously in 1920s in Hollywood is not really acceptable. And so she's othered for that reason as well. And so I think there was just a lot of that discussion of othering in this. The magical realism elements of this book were so good. I love them so much. It's not a fantasy novel though. Like I think if you're going into this thinking like fantasy monsters, you're going to be sorely disappointed. You really, this is more magical realism literary fiction in my mind. So Siren Queen, I actually haven't landed on my star rating yet. I think it's a four and a half because fives I usually reserve for like my absolute, absolute favorites. But the more I think about it, the more I think it is going to be a five. So the only reason that I don't want to give it a five is that I felt like the ending wasn't as satisfying as I wanted it to be. I felt like this book could have been longer and that maybe Nevo is just more used to writing novellas and she had too much story for this particular size of book or this length of book. But who knows? I mean, she wrote it, so the end is probably what she wanted, but I just, the ending was a little bit like, oh, I wanted a little bit more from it. So we're gonna go with four and a half for now, which probably means on Goodreads, I'll end up putting it as a five. Now, in addition to Tor.com-a-thon and uh, Assassins in April taking place in the same week, I had originally also intended on filming a whole vlog for Earth Day, which was on April 22nd. That didn't happen, but I did read some books that related to kind of more nature themes, and uh, those were all Tor.com 
novellas, uh, so, or actually one of them was a short story, but the two novellas that I read are a duology, um, the first being Silver in the Wood and the second being Drowned Country by Emily Tesh. I listened to both of these on audio, um, which I'm happy about. I think they were good audiobooks. I did like the like voice acting and that kind of thing. I gave Silver in the Wood three stars. Um, in this one, we are introduced to our two main characters, one of whom is like a green man character, like a an embodiment of the forest. And then the other one is this like folklorist who has come and he has bought this property and he meets the green man. And there is um, a bit of a romance between the two of them. And there's also some kind of weird stuff going on in the forest because there is this other entity. I don't want to give too much away, but there's this other entity that comes around once a year and the folklorist uh, gets wrapped up in sort of a negative way with this other entity. Again, I'm really trying not to spoil it. It's a novella. It's very short. I gave this three stars because for me, it just wasn't exactly <laughs> what I wanted from this book. I, I think the atmosphere was incredible and like the feeling of being in the forest and like the age of the forest and the age of like the different entities in the forest like I really felt that and I really loved it but I just thought the plot was a little bit lacking and also like the romance I I didn't super buy into either it just it felt a little lackluster yeah three out of four five stars for that one three out of four stars that'd be weird I don't know why you would rate on four stars <laughs> <laughs> so then, though, I did continue on with Drowned Country, which is the second book in the duology, and I actually gave Drowned Country four stars. I enjoyed it much more, and that's because we have the same two main characters, but we also add some more characters. We have the folklorist's mother, and then we also have this young woman who... Um, is getting herself into trouble and actually the first part of the story the two main characters and the folklorist's mother are sent or like they're hired by the girl's family because she's gone missing and they have to find her and when they do find her I just really thought she was a, a really cool character um, and in in the second book we get to see um, like fairyland and some other things that I really enjoyed more than the first book. I just thought the plot of the second book was better. I do think these books could have been longer. Like I think that the stories could have been fleshed out more and that's not something I say often of novellas. Like usually I'm pretty happy with a novella if it leaves me with more questions, but I do think that there was just a little bit too much sparseness in these stories. We didn't dig into them as much as I wanted. We didn't dig into the characters or the relationships as much as I wanted. Um, they just felt a little underdone or unfinished in a way. Now the other thing that I did end up reading was a short story. It's at least I think you'd call it a short story. It's 38 pages according to Goodreads but I listened to it on audio and this was This World is Full of Monsters by Jeff Vandermeer. I was originally going to read Annihilation um, for Earth Day for my vlog and I did start Annihilation but then I realized it wasn't a tour.com publication and I was really trying to read tour.com stuff. So this, This World is Full of Monsters, actually was a tour.com um, published story. So that's why I picked it up. It was really weird. I don't know how to describe this. It's like the story of this person who somehow brings about the end of civilization by like plant monsters and then goes on this crazy journey and there's all these weird plant monster things and the world is very different and like I didn't understand it. I, I'm sure Jeff Vandermeer had a very deep message in what he was writing. It just did not make sense to me. Um, there was a plot but there was so much just weird stuff going on. I don't I don't even know how to talk about this. So yeah, three stars from me on that one. And then the final thing that I, oh no, two more things that I finished in April. Um, Kaikei by Vaishnavi Patel, which was another e-arc that I had. Um, I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it. Very similar to Circe and The Witch's Heart. I gave it four stars and I'm going to do a whole review on it. So I won't say too much here, but I think it just was really great and really explored relationships in a way that I really appreciated and the way that people interact with each other, with family, um, with people in their sphere, people they have power over, people who have power over them. I really just appreciated that exploration. Uh, if you aren't aware, this is a retelling of um, or a reimagining of one character in the Ramayana, which is like an Indian epic 
story, mythological story, and the character Kakei um, is the mother of Rama, who is like a very important mythological figure in Indian mythology. And so we get to find out like her side of the story in the Ramayana. Basically, she is only known for being the stepmother of Rama who banishes him and puts her son on the throne instead. And so this took that little kernel and put like a whole story around it. And I just, I really, really enjoyed it. And the final thing that I finished was The Voyage of the Basilisk by Marie Brennan, book three in the Memoirs of Lady Trent series. My full thoughts can be found in the live that we did um, on the channel, on my channel here, uh, me and my co-hosts. So I will link that down below if you want to go watch that. Did not enjoy it. Two and a half stars. Don't really want to talk about it anymore. Really, really bad uh, representation of a trans character and just like colonialism, cultural appropriation, all that stuff that I just, I don't want to talk about it anymore. So not, not a good book in my opinion. I'm not continuing on with the read along also for the memoirs of Lady Trent. I'm just not getting any value out of those books at this point. So, but the read along will keep going. All of my co-hosts are going to keep um, reading. So if you are interested in that, there's always information down below. Go to the Discord. The link is down below and you can join in on the read-along if you want. Books weren't for me though. That was my April. So thank you so much for hanging out with me. And as always, go read a book.